Hi, everybody. My name is Ken Ashcraft. I work on the App Engine team. It's great to see you all here. Um, specifically, what I work on is a lot of the infrastructure. Uh, I've got a background in distributed systems and scaling and reliability and things like that. And so my talk today is going to be about how to make sure that your app can, can scale and have uh, as few errors as possible so that your users are happy. Because really, at the end of the day, what makes your web app uh, popular is whether or not your users are happy. And if your users are seeing errors or if your website is slow, uh, that's no good and your users won't be coming back to you. So I'm going to talk about three things today. Uh, the first is writing code for production. So as you are building your web app, things to think about, uh, little code snippets to add in to help make sure that uh, your code is ready to be professional quality or production quality. The next thing is testing for performance, helping to find the bottlenecks in the system, the scarce resources, so that when your application does get popular, you'll be able to scale efficiently. And then finally, once you've launched your application and you have tons and tons of users, how to do a safe deployment of the new version. So when you want to push that new feature out, how to make sure that you aren't going to introduce a bug in the process and take your site down and cause all of your users to flee to another website. So first, let's talk about writing code for production. So here's a little snippet. Uh, if you've been to any of the talks so far, uh, you may be familiar with th this, this code. Uh, what we have first is uh, allocating a movie object. And so this is going to be an entity that we're going to store in the data store. So let's say that our web app uh, is a movie ratings site. And so users are allowed to enter in a form that describes the title and the director and some other fields about a movie. Uh, and then we want to store that in the data store. So we're going to get a couple of items from the request, the title and the director, and then we're going to put that in the data store so that it can be accessed later. Now, this is a pretty simple piece of code, and you may not think that much can go wrong. But in fact, there are many things that can happen that are out of all of our control. Uh, we may run out of memory. The allocation of this movie object may be the, the straw that breaks the camel, camel's back and causes our Python interpreter to run out of memory. Uh, we may get a deadline exceeded because we've been executing other code for so long that this little snippet of code is where we run out of time and App Engine says that's enough and raises a deadline exceeded exception. We might run over quota. Uh, you have a limited amount of uh, data store requests that you can make, limited amount of data that you can store in the data store. And this extra movie that you're storing in the data store may put you over quota. There may be a server crash. No matter how good the hardware is that Google is using, it's still possible for that uh, computer to go down. Uh, the power in the data center might go out. Uh, somebody might trip over a cord. There may, the disk may go bad. Many, many things can go wrong that are completely out of our control. And those servers can go down at any time. And so you need to be aware that your code may partially execute uh, and then fail and, and not complete the request, and that you need to handle those cases later on in your code, where, say, for example, you've put two items in the data store, or you intend to put two items in the data store. You put one in, and then the code crashes before you can put the second in. And so later on, when you're doing your queries, you may find the first, but not the second. You need to handle those cases. There may be a data store crash. Uh, again, things can go wrong with machines, and uh, this movie.put could come back with an error. And finally, there may be a coding error that causes an identical entity to already exist. So perhaps you forgot to look up this entity before storing it in the data store. So lots of things can go wrong. And so some of the things that you can do to handle these errors or be aware of these errors is to use logging. The logging module that is built into Python uh, is integrated with Google App Engine so that you can use your admin console to view these logs at a later point in time. So you see I've got a couple lines that are bolded in this snippet of code. And this is a, a fairly contrived example, but what we have here is a user preferences object that we're going to store for each user that uses our application. Now, there should only be one of these user preferences object. Uh, however, it's possible that by some fluke, there happen to be more than one. and so. Here on this line, after we do the query, if we find that there's more than one, we're going to log an error so that we can keep track of that. And if there turn out to be 
no user preferences objects for this user because it's a new user. We're going to log that as well and、uh, log it at the debugging level. And, and so on, if、uh, the user is not logged in, we're also going to make another debug log message. So if I switch over to my,、uh, my dashboard for my application, and I go in here to the logs, and hopefully my wireless is still working. And it appears not to be. So,、uh, oh. No.、Uh, so if I switch. Uh, sorry. Uh, later on, when、uh, your code is actually executing on the production servers, you'll be able to view this in the admin console. So you can view on a request by request basis what log lines were stored、uh, so that you can debug a problem later on if it happens. Similarly, you can use、uh, the email module to email yourself if anything goes wrong. So, here is、uh, the web app request handler, and I've created a subclass of it. A web app defines a handle exception method that will be called whenever one of your request handlers raises an exception. And you can use this to do custom actions. So, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take that exception and we're going to format it into a string. A little bit of Python、uh, magic here.、Um, but the important part is that this lines variable. Contains the traceback. We're going to log that so that we can view it later on in the data store. Or, sorry, in the, in the admin console's log viewer. The next thing that we're going to do is use the mail module to email this exception to, to ourselves. So, the mail module has this、uh, method called sendMail to admins. It knows who the admins of this application are. And so you can quickly create an email that's sent. To you and your, your coworker who are the admins of this application, so that you know what exceptions are being raised, so that you can quickly debug them and track them down. Now, the next thing that you want to do, if this is a professional or production quality application, is you want to provide a, a real error message to your user. You don't want to provide a trace back to them, you don't want to provide a simple 404 not found page. You want to provide a branded error message to the user, perhaps with links to、uh, the support center so they can help report the bug、uh, and move on from there. So, what we've got here is a custom error template. So, if you've seen any of the other examples, you know that it's easy to use things like Django templates、uh, to render an error page. So, we have the template values, which, which right now is empty.、Uh, but If the your current user is an admin of the application, what we're going to do is take that traceback that we formatted from the exception and display it to, to the admin, but only to the admin. So we have a special extra logic inside the, the template to display this traceback if it is present. One of the other things that's important to think about is performance when you are writing your code. And so you can use the built in Python profiler.、Uh, there's a link here for the exact code snippet that you need to use.、Uh, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about an advanced usage of how to use the, the Python profiler. So perhaps、uh, you would like to profile real usage of your application rather than some. Contrived example that you're clicking through as the developer. Maybe you want to see how real users are using your, your application and profile those instances. And so you don't want to turn on the profiler for every single request because the profiler has a significant overhead and will cause significant latency、uh, increase. However, it's probably okay for you to turn it on for one out of every hundred requests or out of 1,000 requests. And your users won't really notice the difference, but you'll be able to get those profile information and aggregate them and use them、uh, to determine where you need to optimize your code. So let's look at how to do that. So, first of all, we're going to have our main function.、Uh, you may have seen something like this before. All it's going to do is take your request、uh, and dispatch it to the correct、uh, request handler. Now, if you're going to use profiling,、uh, you're going to want to wrap this main function. You're going to turn on the profiler and then execute the real main function. And so 
what I've elided here in this profile main function, you can find all those details in the, the link at the bottom of the screen. But basically, uh, at the end of the function, the profile data variable ends up with all of the profile for the execution of this request. So we're going to log this so that we can grab it later on using the admin console's log viewer. And the next thing is we have the actual main function that will be executed. And so I said we only want to execute this one out of every 100 requests. And so I've picked a random number of four. And if I have a random integer that matches that number four, then I'm going to use the profiled main function. And otherwise, I'm just going to use the regular main function, the real main function, the unprofiled function. And so this is a, a neat little trick uh, so that you can gather profile information with real user requests, and you don't have to have your own contrived examples. But the bottom line that I want to get across to you is that when you're writing your code for production is that errors can and will happen. There are many, many things that can go wrong, and so you need to be prepared for those. And if you don't want to show tracebacks to your users, if you don't want them to see error pages all the time, you need to be aware of those errors and handle them. Now, the next thing that I would like to talk about is how to do load tests, things to do and things not to do. So why are load tests important? Well, load tests reveal which parts of your web app are slow, uh, what resources are scarce. So perhaps you use a lot of CPU, or perhaps you use a lot of bandwidth. And through a load test, you can find those resources and find those bottlenecks. And so before your users are swamping your websites or web app with ton, tons of requests, you can find those problems and fix them. So first, a tip on what not to do. Uh, we've seen some people who have tried to run load tests against the dev app server. This is the pure Python implementation that comes in the SDK. It was not intended for performance. It is intended for ease of use, uh, for ease of debugging, and for rapid development. And so the performance characteristics of the dev app server are much, much different than the performance characteristics of the real uh, production system. The other thing that you don't want to do is run a load test that looks like this. We've seen, actually, many people run load tests. And we think it's great that people are trying out the system to see what it can do. But they're running load tests that look like this, and we feel that they're gathering the wrong conclusions. So what we have here is on the y-axis, requests per second, and on the x-axis, time. So usually what happens is a developer says, ah, I'm going to throw a whole bunch of requests at this. So they write a script that spawns off 1,000 threads, and all in parallel makes those requests all, all of a sudden. And then as soon as they return, they stop the load test. So 1,000 requests in a matter of seconds, and then they're done. And what this does uh, is it defeats many of the performance uh, optimizations that we have inside the App Engine system that are designed for organic growth of load rather than this artificial load. Let me talk a little bit about that. So a very simple architecture diagram we have on the left, uh, the user who's going to talk to the App Engine front end and the App Engine front end knows about the apps that are present in the App Engine system, and it knows which Python interpreters have code ready to serve uh, a particular request. So the user makes a request, and it goes through the front end to the correct Python interpreter. And that Python interpreter is busy handling that request until it returns. So what happens if we have a whole bunch of users that all make requests at the same time? Well. Right now, there's only the one Python interpreter, and it's busy with that one request. So those requests, those extra requests, queue up in the App Engine front end. App Engine recognizes that there's more demand for this application, and so it responds. And it creates new Python interpreters. And as those Python interpreters start, those requests get forwarded on to those that are available. But starting a Python interpreter takes some amount of time. It's not instantaneous, uh, and we can only start so many Python interpreters so fast. As an interpreter frees up from a request, 
the front end will uh, forward on the next request that's available to it. So you may think that uh, this is a horrible design, that there's no way that we can scale, that uh, you know, if, if we have to wait for these Python interpreters to start up every single time, that uh, App Engine is gonna have horrible performance. But in fact, what we do is we try to keep these interpreters around for as long as possible after they've been started up. And so if you have a sustained load, your request will go to a warm Python interpreter again and again and again. And so as your load increases and decreases, we start up more interpreters or fewer interpreters. Uh, but with organic growth, which happens over minutes or hours, there's plenty of time for App Engine to respond to this. With inorganic growth, such as this script that someone writes that spawns 1,000 requests all at once, uh, App Engine isn't going to respond very well. And so you'll have increased latencies or perhaps a couple of timeouts. Uh, that you otherwise would not see with organic growth. So what I'd like to encourage you to do is to run a load test that has uh, characteristics that look more like the green line here. We have, uh, at the beginning of the load test, a gradual ramp up that gives App Engine a chance to bring up these Python interpreters. It, brings, it gives Bigtable a chance to bring your data in from disk have it in memory so that it can respond to requests quickly. Then, once things have warmed up, we have sustained load over a number of minutes so that if there's any sort of hiccup in the system, it won't skew the results uh, and so that you'll get a better picture of what things are going to look like uh, with a realistic amount of load. So there are a number of tools out there that you can use to do this uh, internally. Uh, we found a, a very simple tool called HTTPerf uh, available. It's an open source tool that's uh, capable of driving HTTP requests at your web application. There are many others that are more complicated that allow you to script an interaction with your application. So it goes from this page to that page and then this other page. Uh, and so you can emulate many users having their sessions going on concurrently. Now, one of the other things that you'll notice about this green line is that it has significantly less, it's significantly uh, shorter than the red line, uh, that the request per second is significantly less. And the reason for that is that we want to have a realistic load test uh, that is representative of what our actual load is going to be, what we expect our usage to be. So let me uh, talk about a couple of numbers for that. So let's say that we have a goal for our, our website of having 50,000 users per day. For, for many of you, this is uh, an incredible number. This would be great if you had 50,000 users per day. For some of you, this is, is measly. Um, and so take these numbers just as a, a guide uh, that you can adapt to your own needs. So these users are going to have different ways of interacting with your web app. Some of them are going to spend half an hour on your web app and click around and have many, many page views. Others are going to view the front page and leave right away. So let's say, for the sake of argument, that on average we have two page views per user. Translates to 100,000 page views per day. Many of you are familiar with the metric of page views. Now, a page view is actually going to consist of much more than the single HTTP request to fetch the HTML. It's going to consist of CSS and JavaScript and images. And so a single page view may actually be five HTTP requests. So let's say that we actually need to do our load test for 500,000 requests per day. Now, if we take this number, this pretty large number by many people's standards, and divide it by the number of seconds in a day, we'll get something like 5.8 requests per second. Uh, so we can do 100,000 page views per day if we have sustained load of just about six requests per second. So if you go back to this graph that I was showing you before, uh, we had the, the red line where somebody wrote this script that spawned thousands of requests. And over a couple of minutes, they averaged 50 requests per second. But their website is fairly small. Uh, and maybe they're not even going to get this 100,000 page views per day. Maybe they're going to get 10,000 page views per day. 
And so they may be drawing the wrong conclusions entirely, that they're going to run into entirely different bottlenecks and that different resources will be scarce, or they'll be optimizing too early on. And so I encourage you to think a little bit about the numbers that you expect uh, for your, your website and to run realistic load tests. So the qualities of good load test, first of all, it's using the production system and not the dev app server because the production system is designed for performance. The dev app server is designed for ease of debugging. You're going to have a gradual ramp up to give App Engine a chance to warm up for Bigtable to pull your data in off of disk and so that you don't see any timeouts in the beginning of your load test. You're going to have sustained load. So if there are any hiccups along the way, that'll be averaged out uh, over many minutes. And finally, you're going to have realistic load so you th you, that you're not optimizing for the wrong conditions. Now, the next thing that I'd like to talk to you about is how to do safe deployment. Uh, and I had a, a little demo that I, I wanted to do for you, but it looks like my wireless isn't working, so uh, won't give that a try. Um, but the issue is uh, you have a new feature. You make a simple change to your code. Alon has a, uh, a stick for me. Let's see if we can give this a try. That's not so good. All right. Well, so, so the idea is uh, that you, you make some simple fix to your, your code, and uh, you end up with a typo. And you push it live to your users, and all of a sudden, all of your users are seeing an error page. It's a pretty stressful experience. Uh, I'm sure that, that many of you have, have gone through this situation. I know that I have, uh, that when you're running your Apache server, the equivalent of copying your code to your server, you send a sig hub and you cross your fingers and hope that you didn't break anything along the way. Uh, and so App Engine has a way to, to address this so that you can upload your code and not have to worry uh, about pushing a bug live to your users before you've had a chance to inspect it in the real system. So again, simple architecture diagram. We've got our user. We've got our App Engine front end, a number of Python interpreters that can handle uh, this request for, let's say it's wiki.io is the name of my application, uh, and uh, then the data store on the back end. So when I upload the application, immediately uh, it gets replaced with this new version, and all requests start going to this new version. So I have no opportunity to uh, provide a new, um, uh, to, to debug any sorts of problems in the production environment. However, with App Engine, we provide a facility so that you can have multiple versions running in parallel. So you can upload a new version, say version 2, and it'll be running in parallel to version 1. And requests for version 1, well, you don't need to request it specifically. By default, all requests for your application will go along this path to version 1. And if you want to see how version 2 is doing, you can make a request specifically for it and requests will go along this path through version 2. Now, you notice that we have the exact same data store for both of these versions. We don't do anything magical of cloning your data store on demand. Uh, this is actually what I, I think is, is a benefit. So you're using the real data with your real production environment so that you know that when you flip the switch and make version 2 live, that everything is going to just work. And hopefully, you've done all of your extra debugging places where you can corrupt the data store uh, on the dev app server and work through those issues before you upload. So the way that you control the version is in your app.yaml file. Uh, for those of you who have done any amount of development, uh, this is the simple file that sits on the root level directory of your application and controls 
uh, a number of configuration issues about your app. app. Uh, so we see here on the second line that we can control the version number. Now this can be an alphanumeric string, so it could be whatever you want. Perhaps it's a date. Perhaps it's your username is this version, is uh, controlled by this version, and your coworker names his own version after himself. I would encourage you that if you are using a version control system like Subversion or Perforce or any of these others that have a revision number, that you use that as your version number. Uh, so that when this, your code is running live on the server, you know exactly what code is up there. You know that your client was synced to this revision number before you uploaded it. And so I would suggest that you create a, a build script that populates this version number uh, specifically for your version control system. Uh, now this brings up another point that I'd like to talk about is that App Engine is not designed uh, for version control of your source code. Uh, there are many other systems. Uh, Google Code has one uh, that's based on subversion that are much, much better at providing histories and diffs and all the sorts of facilities that you want to do when collaborating on code with other people. What App Engine is good at is the ability to push a single unit of code live uh, and switch between different versions quickly. So the way this works is I would go into the admin console uh, if my wireless were working, and show you how to do this uh, so that you could uh, simply click a make a couple of clicks, and it would take all requests that are currently going for wiki.io.appspot.com. Instead of going to version one, they'll be switched around and go to version two. And then if you want to access version one specifically, you have to uh, request it as part of the host name of your, uh, your request. Uh, so, a couple of things that you can do with these versions. Uh, here's the, the template for the URLs. So if you want to request a specific version, you've got the major version, which you included in your app.yaml file. You've got the minor version, which is decided by App Engine at the time of upload. You've got your app name, and then appspot.com. So if you're using a tool like Selenium, which I highly recommend, uh, Selenium is a way to script your interactions with a web page and ensure that uh, it is behaving uh, as expected so that you can follow flows through your web page, make sure that it, things are rendering properly, and so on. It's an automated tool for doing this. You can point Selenium at a specific version of your application, at this newly uploaded version of your application, run all of your regression tests before you make it live for all of your users. And the last thing that I encourage you to do is use the log viewer. Uh, the log viewer has the ability to display the logs for different versions. So version one has its own set of logs. Version two has its own set of logs. So if your, your beta version that you just uploaded is throwing errors, you can find those separately from the version that is currently being uh, provided to all of your users. So along the way, we've had a number of, of feature requests from, from developers. Uh, we think these are great, uh, and I'd like to talk about a couple of these that we've thought about. So if you went to Marissa's keynote this morning, she talked quite a bit about A-B testing, the ability to have multiple versions of your application or your website running at the same time so that you can figure out which version is better. So some percentage of your traffic goes to version one, some percentage of your traffic goes to version two. Uh, you can imagine that we have a lot of infrastructure uh, that would, in place that would make this possible. Uh, one of the things that I would like to hear from you is what facilities you would need in the admin console to really make this uh, a powerful tool for you. What do you need to know uh, in terms of debugging? Uh, what uh, analytic information would you like to see in the admin console if we were to provide A-B testing? Another thing that's been uh, highly requested is integration with Subversion. So what this means is that if you are using Subversion or any other source control system to manage your, your web application, that you can quickly go to your app's admin console, click a deploy from Subversion button. Uh, 
this seems like a, a great idea, and many uh, web app developers have such a system where you have to check it in to your subversion repository before it gets pushed live. Um, while we don't provide this facility today, it is entirely possible for you to build this yourself. Uh, you could write a script that checks out the latest version from your subversion repository and wraps the appcfg.py upload script and uploads it to the servers so that it can all be part of one step. And you can make sure that uh, deployment from subversion is a, an easy and quick thing to do. Another feature that we've seen uh, quite a bit is the ability to edit running code. So maybe you don't have all the code on your local desktop. Maybe you want to make a quick little tweak. Uh, and actually, this kind of goes counter to my argument of using versions and doing safe deployment and careful deployment, because the ability to edit running code means that it's all that much easier to put in typos. Uh, and so from my point of view, where I want to encourage people to build professional quality applications, the ability to edit running code kind of goes against that. Uh, but I'm not going to say that, that we wouldn't support such a thing in the future if there really was high demand for it. But that's why we haven't done it at this stage. So in summary, talked about a couple of things. The first was to write code to handle errors. We know that things are going to go wrong, uh, that computers are going to fail, that there may be bugs in our code, and that we need to use things like logging or email to, to catch these exceptions and to display them so that we can figure out what went wrong later on. The next thing is to do realistic load tests. Uh, I think it's great that people are doing load tests. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to, to learn about the properties of the system, but I encourage you to really think about how you're doing your load test to make sure that you're getting, the realist, that you're getting reliable numbers and drawing the correct c conclusions. And the final point was to use versions for safe deployment so that you don't have to worry about making a typo, pushing it live to your users, and then having them all complain and flock to a different website. So thank you very much. So I'll take questions. Uh, there are two mic microphones here. If you'll please come up to those. Hi. Yes. W what techniques do you recommend for being able to uh, maybe change uh, the kind of tracing you're getting in real time for your application so that you're adjusting what's going into the log based on activity you're seeing or errors you're finding? Uh, so you can use different log levels. Uh, so the normal Python logging module has logging.debug, logging.info, logging.error. And the admin console's log viewer allows you to filter out any log levels that are below a certain level, so that if you only want to see the error log levels, the admin console's log viewer makes that really easy to do. But, but can you actually affect your application in real time to, you know, how would, I, I could envision, for instance, using some data in the database to control um, how my application is going to do logging for me so that I could, as an admin, go in and adjust it because I wouldn't want it to be doing all the logging all the time. Sure. Uh, you know, that's, that's a great idea. You can uh, put an entity in your data store that controls the, uh, the logging level. I'd encourage you to cache that data using uh, memcache so that you're not querying the data store on every single request to find this value that's not going to change very often. Uh, but uh, that's, that's a very reasonable thing to do. Yeah. Um, most of my applications, I rely heavily on like, multiple subdomains for like, each user has their own like, site or whatever. Um, yeah. And with the versions, how, does that, like, how do you work around that? Um, th that's something that's, that's fairly hard to do um, with, with the versions and with the, the infrastructure that we have. Um, and I, I don't have a great answer for that today, uh, for, for that sort of support. <laughs> Um, you know, hopefully we can work on something like that in the future, but in the meantime, I think you'd have to use the URL space, uh, you know, slash username instead. I, I think the, uh, that's very interesting. You mentioned about the A-B testing and the ability to work with multiple sites. Uh, uh, also, you talked about the 
do realistic load testing and be careful about how you go about it. Can you throw a little bit more light on some of the approaches? Do you have some recommendations or, you know, do you follow some methodologies or you know, how do you see things uh, going um, ahead? So, so uh, recommendations in terms of, of doing load testing, I'd encourage you to uh, find these existing tools that are designed for load tests uh, that are good at determining where the bottleneck is and making sure that it's not your client that is the bottleneck and that it is actually the server and a certain part of the server that is the bottleneck. Uh, these existing tools are, many of them are free. Uh, they're, they're really great and provide detailed information. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, great, thanks. That's yep. very helpful, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I have a, one was a comment and the other is a question. Uh, the comment was the A-B testing and those kind of stuff were that was a new idea for me when I heard, saw it in the keynote. So when you ask for feedback on what we would like as features, since it's a new idea for me, I don't even know where to begin. So if maybe there were references for like how do <coughs> other people do it or how is A-B testing done, then we could probably give better feedback as to what we'd like as a feature. Sure. Uh, the other question was, um, so you've been going on about load testing, and then in other presentations you've been talking about being prepared for things like slash dotting. Yeah. Um, and then I also got onto thinking of <coughs> perhaps denial of service if someone else is in an automated way trying to hammer my site. Uh, it sounds like it's not really prepared for that, and also if I end up paying for requests or the amount of data that's going out, in those kind of situations, if it's a malicious thing, how is that going to work? You should be able to detect that, I would assume. Sure, so, so there are a number of, of points that you brought up there. Uh, the issue about slash dotting. Uh, many people think that, that slash dot, uh, that the load increase is vertical, that it goes from zero to hundreds of thousands of requests per second. Uh, and actually, it's, it's nothing like that. It's, it takes many minutes for a, a slash dot to happen. Uh, and that it's over the period of 15 minutes or 30 minutes for this load to increase. And so App Engine is designed to handle that sort of increase in load. It's not designed to handle the absolute vertical increase in load, but something spread out. Uh, and if you do get uh, slash shotted, uh, hopefully you've done your load tests beforehand so that you found the bottlenecks and you know which resources are scarce. Um, and, and hopefully, the free quota is enough to, to get by right now. Um, when we do support billing, uh, you would be able to uh, support that as well. Um, one of the, the nice things about our quota system is that it doesn't use up all of your quota right away. It lets it go a little bit at a time. And so you're allowed to spike your application, to have a spike in load, but you're not able to use up all of your quota in five minutes for the entire day. So you'll be able to spike for some period of time, and if load goes above that, we'll deny requests. But then later on in the day, you'll get some more quota and be able to use it later on. So your application won't run out immediately if somebody, say, attacks you. Uh, later on in the day, you'll be able to recover and continue serving requests. Could you talk about database versioning patterns that you anticipate? Database querying patterns. That versioning. Just, versioning. Um, so uh, a couple of the other talks have, have touched on this. Uh, I would encourage you to use backwards compatible uh, strategies uh, that are pretty similar to a lot of uh, RPC uh, strategies where you have optional fields so that uh, it's, it's the equivalent of having a client that has the new version of the software and the server that has the old version of the software, and so that they can be compatible with each other. Uh, and being able to work with data that perhaps doesn't have all the fields present. So in your models, you'd say that fields are optional. And if they aren't present, then you'd try to fill them in where possible. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so apparently the A-B testing was really a popular question, and you, you you asked for features, and the feature that I would ask for is, um, I want to log a message, and I'm going to say, this is an app of it, and I'm going to give a number. And then what would be nice is asynchronously, like in the background, all those log messages are scanned and 
counters are provided and you could provide an RRD tool type approach to like providing like, you know, graphs and metrics for the, m for my own application level counters. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, with your user's API, it seems to be very Google centric. The person has to either have a Google account or have a Google for my domain account, which is still very clearly branded as Google. If I'm building an application, say I'm 37 Signals or a similar company to that where I'm building an application, I'm going out and serving companies, and I don't want them to know what's behind my, uh, what's behind my curtain, is there a way for me to subclass the user's API and still get the benefits of that but build my own model to where it's storing my information in my database? Um, we don't have a whole lot of support for extending the, the user's API uh, and providing custom login. Um, you can imagine that it would be nice if you could provide a little bit of more branding on that login page, um, and that, that would be a great feature to add. Um, but in terms of hiding that login, uh, I, I don't know that that, that provides any real uh, benefit, because the, the benefit of using the, the Google login is that they already have an account, and they don't need to create another account for your application. If you want them to create another account for your application, you're free to do so. You don't have to use the Google login. You can handle the cookies and everything yourself. Um, it's just that many people find that tedious and difficult to do, and so we integrated that to make it easy. But if you wanted to use OpenID, say, you're free to do that. My question is more as to, like, you mentioned email to users or some of the things that require a user object to be passed to them for that function to work. Is there a way where I can tell the system that my custom uh, my custom class behaves like a user class? Sure. Um, you can write your own uh, user class that uh, is compatible with these APIs okay. uh, and, and just, just plug it in. Uh, you know, it, it's Python, so you can do pretty much whatever you want to do. Okay. Um, cool. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Uh, my question is uh, not directly related to scalability. It's more related to performance and network delays. So can I host... Uh, uh, can I choose a geographical location when I host an application in Google app? For example, my customers are in like Europe or Asia. I don't want them to like, you know, suffer the network delays when they like, uh, request the application. Uh, so if I understood correctly, the, the question was about geographic latencies and having users in one part of the world and having your application run in a different part of the world. Whether the, as a hosting provider, like whether I have any control as an application um, deployer. Um, sorry, I, I didn't catch how, how okay, uh, what, can what I, I said. Can I choose that when I host an application, whether like you know, I want to run this application in servers in Europe or Asia or US? Sure. Uh, so being able to choose where the application is run, uh, this geographic locality is something that we are very, very aware of at Google and matters to all of our services. Um, we don't currently provide this facility in App Engine. Um, we w it's something that we would like to do in the long term, uh, but it's, it's pretty difficult. Uh, we, this question was raised in the fireside chat uh, just before this. Um, and so I, I don't have a whole lot to, to add there other than, yes, it's definitely an issue. We, we know that people want to support it. We know that it's important to support, um, and we'd like to work on it in the future. Thank you. Regarding the versioning and the subdomains, um, the current version numbers are they? Do they have to be numeric, or can they be like a git, git, you know, hash or something like that? Uh, we restrict it to we restrict it to uh, I think letters and numbers um, and maybe dashes um, because it has to be part of the URL. There is a limited number of characters, uh, or part of the host name. There's a limited number of characters that okay. it can be. So I guess one one request might be that. Um, I know it'd be kind of weird, but if you could do some sort of almost regex on the subdomain so that you can elect to determine how to do versioning versus subdomains, um, because it seems like if you have a pretty flexible way of defining, you know, like the URLs, that you should be able to define how you want to do your versioning versus how you want to do subdomains. That's a good idea. Yeah, you can imagine rather than using the the host name to do the versioning, that there's a magic query parameter that right. you could append or a cookie. Um, they could also handle this. But it issue. sounds like, as, as far as you know, that you could use almost like a, a git hash as, as a version then. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. 
It sounds like a lot of the, the work that you're doing for, you're talking about doing the versioning and stuff, is because there's no QA tier or a staging tier. You have a development environment, and then you go straight to a production which is hosted by Google and the full everything. Sure. And, and my question is, is, is there is a, there's a value to a QA tier or, or a staging type tier where you get a copy of the database and you can, you, you can manipulate it and use it. Is there any notion of being able to uh, break out a stage so that you have that database that's tied in on the back? Is there a way or any plan to allow you in an administrative mode or something like that for some class of users to access a copy of that or back it up or something like that? Uh, while we don't have any tools to make this really easy for you to do, it's possible for you to do this today. You could copy some chunk of your data out mm -hmm. of the data store, use the bulk uploader to upload it to a different app, and then use that for your QA. So have a second uh, application. Yes. Right. The other question I had was around, um, Right now, people are, it's free, and it's not being billed, but once it's billed, um, doing load testing on your, on your environment where you're being billed by the request or by the storage and that kind of stuff, has there been any consideration given into uh, a class of users or a particular login which is doing load testing and therefore wouldn't be billed? Um, I haven't really thought about that issue, but uh, we are always going to provide some amount for free. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're doing realistic load tests, hopefully you'll be able to stay under that, that free quota, because if your load test can't stay under that free quota, well, then your actual load isn't going to stay under it as oh, well. Oh, right, no, but I mean, assuming that you were paying, assuming that you were over the free quota, and that you're paying by the megabyte or whatever it is at that point, then to throw in a load test is that you're basically costing yourself money to do, to do load testing. Sure, um, and with, with pretty much any other hosting provider, like you need no, but to you have. Could, but, but every other environment is I may be able to have, if I'm doing like a J2E stack or something like that, I, I might be able to have a smaller environment that I set up myself, right? That's not in my hosted environment, right? And I can't do that here. You say the development environment is, is different. It's not, it's not built for the performance. You get different characteristics. Uh, so there's no way to, for me to emulate that with my hardware or, or my environment. Well, uh, if you were to do that load test on your own hardware, in your own environment, it wouldn't give you the same results as doing the load test on Google's hardware and Google's environment. Mm. And so th there, there are pluses and minuses to that. Uh, we've hoped, we hope to put pricing at a level where you could do a load test for, for some number of minutes, and it's not going to cost you an incredible amount of money. Uh, you know, maybe it's going to cost you a couple dollars. Uh, and so hopefully that's not a big deal and that in the big picture it doesn't matter. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, I got a quick uh, versioning question. Um, so once you've uploaded, you know, version two of Wiki.io and then you've still got the, you know, the 1.1 Wiki.io uh, subdomain out there and then you, you test it out and you decide it's good and you switch it to the production view, is the 1.1 Domain, is that still live? Can people still hit it, or can you turn off access to that so that it's no longer uh, available? You can actually just delete that version from the admin console. Um, but until you do, it's, it's, it's available. OK. So there is an easy way to just turn it off then? Yeah, it's, I, I wish that my demo was, was working, uh, but you can just click one, one button, and it, and it goes away. OK. All right. Thank you very much for your time.